Pippin lay in a dark and troubled dream. It seemed that he could hear his own small voice echoing in black tunnels, calling Frodo! Frodo! But instead of Frodo, hundreds of hideous orc faces grinned at him out of the shadows. Hundreds of hideous arms grasped at him from every side. Where was Merry? He woke. Cold air blew on his face. He was lying on his back. Everything was coming and the sky above was growing dim. He turned and found that the dream was little worse than the waking. His wrists, legs and ankles were tied with cords. Beside him, Mary lay, white-faced, with a dirty rag bound across his brows. All about them sat or stood a great company of orcs. Slowly in Pippin's aching head, memory pieced itself together and became separated from dream shadows. Of course, he and Mary had run off into the woods. What had come over them? Why had they dashed off like that, taking no notice of old Strider? They had run a long way shouting. He could not remember how far or how long. And then suddenly, they had crashed right into a group of orcs. They were standing, listening and they did not appear to see Merry and Pippin until they were almost in their arms. Then they yelled, and dozens of other goblins had sprung out of the trees. Merry and he had drawn their swords, but the orcs did not wish to fight, and had tried only to lay hold of them. Even when Merry had cut off several of their arms and hands. Good old Merry. Then Boromir had come leaping through the trees. He had made them fight. He slew many of them and the rest fled. But they had not gone far on the way back when they were attacked again. By a hundred orcs at least, some of them very large, and they shot a rain of arrows, always at Boromir. Boromir had blown his great horn till the woods rang, and at first the orcs had been dismayed and had drawn back, but when no answer but the echoes came, they had attacked more fiercely than ever. Pippin did not remember much more, his last memory was of Boromir leaning against a tree, plucking out an arrow. Then darkness fell suddenly. I suppose I was knocked on the head, he said to himself. I wonder if poor Mary is much hurt. What has happened to Boromir? Why didn't the orcs kill us? Where are we? Where are we going? He could not answer the questions. He felt cold and sick. I wish Gandalf had never persuaded Elrond to let us come, he thought. What good have I been? Just a nuisance, a passenger, a piece of luggage. I've been stolen and just a piece of luggage for the orcs. I hope Strider or someone will come and claim us. But ought I to hope for it? Won't I throw out all the plans? I wish I could get free. He struggled a little, quite uselessly. One of the orcs, sitting near, laughed and said something to a companion in their abominable tongue. Rest while you can, little fool, he said then to Pippin, in the common speech, which he made almost as hideous as his own language. Rest while you can. We'll find a use for your legs before long. You'll wish you had got none before we get home. If I had my way, you'd wish you were dead now, said the other. I'll make you squeak, you miserable rat. He stooped over Pippin, bringing his yellow fangs close to his face. He had a black knife with a long jagged blade in his hand. Lie quiet, or I'll tickle you with this. He hissed. Don't draw attention to yourself, or I'll make for you, my orders. He passed into a long, angry speech in his own tongue that slowly died away into muttering and snarling. Terrified, Pippin lay still, though the pain at his wrists and ankles was growing, and the stones beneath him were boring into his back. To take his mind off himself, he listened intently to all that he could hear. There were many voices round about, and though orc speech sounded at all times full of hate and anger, it seemed plain that something like a quarrel had begun and was getting hotter. To Pippin's surprise, he found that much of the talk was intelligible, 
Many of the orcs were using ordinary language. Apparently, the members of two or three quite different tribes were present, and they could not understand one another's orc speech. There was an angry debate concerning what they were to do now, which way they were to take and what should be done with the prisoners. There's no time to kill them properly, said one. No time for play on this trip. That can't be helped, said another. But why not kill them quick? Kill them now. They're a cursed nuisance. We're in a hurry. The evening's coming on and we ought to get a move on. Order, said a third voice in a deep growl. Kill all, but not the halflings. They are to be brought back alive as quickly as possible. That's my orders. What are they wanted for? Why, why alive? Asked several voices. Do they get good sword? No. I heard that one of them has got something. Something that's wanted for the war. Some elvish plot or other. Anyway, they'll both be questioned. Is that all you know? Why don't we search them to find out? We might find something that we could use ourselves. That is a very interesting remark sneered a voice, softer than the others, but more evil. I may have to report that. The prisoners are not to be searched or plundered. Those are my orders. And mine too, said the deep voice. Alive as captured. No spoiling. That's my orders. Not our orders, said one of the earlier voices. We have come all the way from the mines to kill and avenge our folk. I wish to kill, and then go back north. Then you can wish again, said the growling voice. I am Ugluk. I command. I've returned to Isengard by the shortest road. Is Saruman the master or the great eye? Said the evil voice. We should go back at once to look birds. If we could cross the great river, we might, said another voice. But there are not enough of us to venture down the bridges. I came across said the evil voice. A winged Nazgul awaits us northward on the east bank. Maybe, maybe. Then you'll fly off without prisoners and get all the pay and praise and lugberts, and leave us on foot as best we can through the horse country. No, we must stick together. These lands are dangerous, full of foul rebels and brigands. Aye, we must stick together, growled Ugluk. I don't trust you, you little swine. You've got no guts outside of your own styes. But for us, you'd all have run away. We are the fighting Borokai. We slew the great warrior. We took the prisoners. We are the servants of Saruman, the wise. The white hand. The hand that gives us man's flesh to eat. We came out of Isengard and led you here. And we shall lead you back by the way we choose. I am Ugluk. I have spoken. You have spoken more than enough, Ugluk, sneered the evil voice. I wonder how they would like it in the birds. They might think that Ugluk's shoulders needed relieving of a swollen head. They might ask where his strange ideas came from. Did they come from Saruman, perhaps? Who does he think he is? Setting up on his own with his filthy white badges? They might agree with me. With Grishnak, their trusted messenger. And I, Grishnak, say this. Saruman is a fool. And a dirty, treacherous fool. But the great eye is on him. Swine, is it? How do you folk like being called swine by the muckrakers of a dirty little wizard? It's orc flesh they eat, I'll warrant. Many loud yells and orc speech answered him. In the ringing clash of weapons being drawn, cautiously Pippin rolled over hoping to see what would happen. His guards had gone to join the fray. In the twilight he saw a large black orc, probably Ugluk, standing facing Grishnyak, a short crooked-legged creature very broad with long arms that hung almost to the ground. Round them were many smaller goblins. Pippin supposed that these were the ones from the north. They had drawn their knives and swords, but hesitated to attack Ugluk. 
Ugluk shouted, and a number of other orcs of nearly his own size ran up. Then suddenly, without warning, Ugluk sprang forward, and with two swift strokes, swept the heads off two of his opponents. Grishnyak stepped aside and vanished into the shadows. The others gave way and one stepped backwards and fell over Mary's prostrate form with a curse. Yet that probably saved his life, for Ugluk's followers leaped over him and cut down another with their broad-bladed swords. It was the yellow fang guard. His body fell right on top of Pippin, still clutching his long sword knife. Put up your weapons! shouted Ugluk. And let's have no more nonsense. We'll go straight west from here, and down the stair. From there, straight to the downs, and then along the river to the forest. And we march day and night. Is that clear? Now, thought Pippin. If only it takes the ugly fellow a little while to get his troop under control, I've got a chance. A gleam of hope had come to him. The edge of the black knife had snicked his arm, and then slid down to his wrist. He felt the blood trickling onto his hand, but he also felt the cold touch of steel against his skin. The orcs were getting ready to march again, but some of the northerners were still unwilling, and the Isengarders slew two more before the rest were cowed. There was much cursing and confusion. For the moment, Pippin was unwatched. His legs were securely bound, but his arms were only tied about the wrists, and his hands were in front of him. He could move them both together, though the bonds were cruelly tight. He pushed the dead orc to one side, then hardly daring to breathe, he drew the knot of the wrist cord up and down against the blade of the knife. It was sharp and the dead hand held it fast. The cord was cut. Quickly, Pippin took it in his fingers and knotted it again in a loose bracelet of two loops and slipped it over his hands. Then he lay very still. Pick up those prisoners! shouted Ugluk. Don't play any tricks with them. If they are not alive when we get back, someone else will die too! An orc seized Pippin like a sack, put its head between his tied hands, grabbed his arms and dragged them down until Pippin's face was crushed against its neck. Then it jolted off with him. Another treated Merry in the same way. The orc's claw-like hand gripped Pippin's arm like iron. The nails bit into him. He shut his eyes and slipped back into evil dreams. Suddenly he was thrown onto the stony floor again. It was early night, but the dim moon was already falling westward. They were on the edge of a cliff that seemed to look out over a sea of pale mist. There was a sound of water falling nearby. The scouts have come back at last, said an orc close at hand. Well, what did you discover? Growled the voice of Ugluk. Only a single horseman. And he made off westwards. All's clear now. Now, I dare say, but how long? You, you fools. You should have shot him. Here, raise the alarm. The cursed horse breeders will hear of us by morning. Now we'll have to lick it. Double quick. A shadow bent over Pippin. It was Ugluk. Sit up, said the orc. My lads are tired of lugging you about. We have got to climb down, and you must use your legs. Be helpful now. No crying out, no trying to escape. We have ways of paying for tricks that you won't like. Though they won't spoil your usefulness for the master. He cut the thongs round Pippin's legs and ankles, picked him up with his hair and stood him on his feet. Pippin fell down and Ugluk dragged him up by his hair again. Several orcs laughed. Ugluk thrust a flask between his teeth and poured some burning liquid down his throat. He felt a hot, fierce glow flow through him. The pain in his legs and ankles vanished. He could stand. Now for the other one, said Ugluk. Pippin saw him go to Mary, who was lying close by, and kick him. Mary groaned. Seizing him roughly, Ugluk pulled him into a sitting position and tore the bandage off his head. Then he smeared the wound with some dark stuff out of a small wooden box. Mary cried out and struggled wildly. The orcs clapped and hooted. Can't take his medicine! They jeered. What's good for him? We shall have some fun later! But at that moment, Ugluk was not engaged in sport. He needed speed and had to humor unwilling followers. He was healing Mary in orc fashion, and his treatment worked swiftly. When he had forced a drink from his flask down the hobbit's throat, cut his leg bonds and dragged him to his feet, Mary stood up, looking pale but grim and defiant, and very much alive. 
The gash in his forehead gave him no more trouble, but he bore a brown scar to the end of his days. Hello, Pippin, he said. So you've come on this little expedition too? Where do we get bed and breakfast? Now then, said Ugluk. None of that. Hold your tongues. No talk to one another. Any trouble will be reported at the other end, and he'll know how to pay you. You'll get bed and breakfast, all right. More than you can stomach. The orc band began to descend a narrow ravine, leading down into the misty plain below. Merry and Pippin, separated by a dozen orcs or more, climbed down with them. At the bottom they stepped onto grass, and the hearts of the hobbits rose. Now, straight on! shouted Ugluk. West, and a little north. Follow the bush. What are we going to do with sunrise? said some of the northerners. Go on running, said Ugluk. What do you think? Sit on the grass and wait for the white skins to join the picnic. But we can't run in the sunlight. Hmm. You'll run with me behind you, said Ugluk. Run! Or you'll never see your beloved holes again. By the white hand, what's the use of sending out mountain maggots on a trip only half tried? Then the whole company began to run with the long loping strides of orcs. They kept no order thrustling, jostling, and cursing. Yet their speed was very great. Each hobbit had a guard of three. Pippin was far back in the line. He wondered how long he would be able to go on at this pace. He had had no food since the morning. One of his guards had a whip, but at present the orc liquor was still hot in him. His wits, too, were wide awake. Every now and again there came to his mind unbidden a vision of the keen face of Strider bending over a dark trail and running, running behind. But what could even a ranger see except a confused trail of orc feet? His own little prince and Mary's were overwhelmed by the trampling of the iron-shod orcs before them and behind them and about them. They had gone only a mile or so from the cliff when the land sloped down into a wide shallow depression, where the ground was soft and wet. Mist lay there, pale glimmering in the last rays of the sickle moon. The dark shapes of the orcs in front grew dim, and then were swallowed up. Hi, steady now! shouted Ugluk from the rear. A sudden thought leapt into Pippin's mind, and he acted on it at once. He swerved aside to the right and dived out of the reach of his clutching guard, head first into the mist. He landed sprawling on the grass. Oh! yelled Ugluk. There was for a moment turmoil and confusion. Pippin sprang up and ran, but the orcs were after him. Some suddenly loomed up right in front of him. No hope of escape, thought Pippin. But there is a hope that I've left some of my own marks unspoiled on the wet ground. He groped with his two tied hands at his throat and unclasped the brooch of his cloak. Just as long arms and hard claws seized him, he let it fall. There. I suppose it will lie until the end of time. He thought. I don't know why I did it, but if the others have escaped, they've probably all gone with Frodo. A whip thong curled around his legs and he stifled a cry. Enough! said Ugluk running up. Ah, he's still got to run a long way yet. Make them both run. Just use the whip as a reminder. But that's not all. He snarled, turning to Pippin. I shan't forget. Payment is only put off. Blackout! Neither Pippin nor Mary remembered much of their later part of the journey. Evil dreams and evil waking were blended into a long tunnel of misery, with hope growing ever fainter behind. They ran and they ran, striving to keep up the pace set up by the orcs. Licked every now and again with a cruel thong cunningly handled. If they halted or stumbled, they were seized and dragged for some distance. The warmth of the orc draught had gone. Pippin felt cold and sick again. Suddenly he fell face downward on the turf. Hard hands with rending nails gripped him and lifted him. He was carried like a sack once more, and darkness grew about him. Whether the darkness of another night or a blindness of his eyes, he could not tell. 
Dimly, he became aware of voices, clamoring. It seemed that many of the orcs were demanding a halt. Ugluk was shouting. And he felt himself flung to the ground, and he lay as he fell, till black dreams took him. But he did not long escape from pain. Soon the iron grip of merciless hands was on him again. For a long time he was tossed and shaken, and then slowly the darkness gave way, and he came back to the waking world, and found that it was morning. Orders were shouted, and he was thrown roughly on the grass. There he lay for a while, fighting with despair. His head swam, but from the heat in his body he guessed that he had been given another draught. An orc stooped over him, and flung him some bread and a strip of raw dried flesh. He ate the stale grey bread hungrily, but not the meat. He was famished, but not yet so famished as to eat flesh flung from him by an orc. The flesh of he dared not guess what creature. He sat up and looked about. Mary was not far away. They were by the banks of a swift narrow river. Ahead mountains loomed. A tall peak was catching the first rays of the sun. A dark smudge of the forest lay on the lower slopes before them. There was much shouting and debating among the orcs. A quarrel seemed on the point of breaking out again between the northerners and the Isengarders. Some were pointing back away south, and some were pointing eastward. Very well, said Ugluk. Leave them to me. No killing as I've told you before, but if you want to throw away what we've come all the way to get, throw it away. I'll look after it. Let the fighting uruk do the work, as usual. If you're afraid of the white skins, run! Run! There's the forest! He shouted, pointing ahead. Get to it! It's your best hope! Off you go, and quick, before I knock a few more heads off to put some sense into the others! There was some cursing and scuffling, and then most of the northerners broke away and dashed off. Over a hundred of them, running wildly along the river towards the mountains. The hobbits were left with the Isengarders, a grim, dark band. Four score, at least, of large, swart, slant-eyed orcs, with great bows and short, broad-bladed swords. A few of the larger and bolder northerners remained with them. Ah. Now, uh, we'll deal with Grishnak, said Ugluk. But some of his own followers were looking uneasily southwards. I know, growled Ugluk. The cursed horse boys have gone wind of us. But that's all your fault, Slugger. You and the other scouts ought to have your ears cut off. But we are the fighters. We'll feast on horse flesh yet. Or something better. <laughs> At that moment, Pippin saw why some of the troop had been pointing eastward. From that direction there now came hoarse cries, and there was Grishnak again and at his back a couple of score of others like him. Long-armed, crooked-legged orcs. They had a red eye painted on their shields. Ugluk stepped forward to meet them. So, you've come back, he said. Thought better of it, eh? I've returned to see that orders are carried out the prisoners safe, answered Grishnak. Indeed, said Ugluk. Waste of effort. I'll see that orders are carried out in my command. And what else did you come back for? You went in a hurry. Did you leave anything behind? I left a fool, snarled Grishnak. But there were some stout fellows with him that are too good to lose. I knew you'd lead them into a mess. I've come to help them. Ah, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ha, splendid, laughed Ugluk. But unless you've got some guts for fighting, you've taken the wrong way. The birch was your road. The white skins are coming. What's happened to your precious Nazgul? Has he had another mount shot under him? Now, if you had brought him along, that might have been useful. If these Nazgul are all that they make out. <gasps> Nazgul! Nazgul! Said Grishnak, shivering and licking his lips, as if the word had a foul taste that he savoured painfully. You speak of what is deep beyond the reach of your muddy dreams of luck, he said. Nazgul, all that they make out. One day you'll wish that you had not said that. Hey, man. He snarled fiercely. You ought to know that they are the apple of the great eye. 
But the winged Nazgul, not yet. Not yet. He won't let them show themselves across the great river yet. Not too soon. Therefore the war. And other purposes. You seem to know a lot, said Ugluk. More than is good for you, I guess. Perhaps those at Lugbirch might wonder how and why. But in the meantime, the uruk of Isengard can do the dirty work, as usual. Don't stand slavering there. Get your rabble together. The other swine are legging it to the forest. You'd better follow. You wouldn't get back to the Great River alive. Right off the mark. Now, I'll be on your heels. The Isengarders seized Merry and Pippin again and slung them on their backs. Then the troops started off. Hour after hour they ran, pausing now and again only to sling the hobbits to fresh carriers, either because they were quicker and hardier, or because of some plan of Grishniak's. The Isengarders gradually passed through the orcs of Mordor, and Grishniak's folk closed in behind. Soon they were gaining also on the northerners ahead. The forest began to draw nearer. Pippin was bruised and torn, his aching head was grated by the filthy jowl in the hairy ear of the orc that held him. Immediately in front were bowed backs and tough thick legs going up and down, up and down, unresting, as if they were made of wire and horn, beating out the nightmare seconds of an endless time. In the afternoon, Ugluk's troop overtook the northerners. They were flagging in the rays of the bright sun, Winter sun shining in a pale cool sky, though it was. Their heads were down and their tongues lolling out. Jeered the Isengarders. A cry from Drishnyak showed that this was not mere jest. Horsemen riding very swiftly had indeed been sighted, still far behind but gaining on the orcs, gaining on them like a tide over the flats and folk straying in a quicksand. The Isengarders began to run with a redoubled pace that astonished Pippin. A terrific spurt, it seemed, for the end of the race. Then he saw that the sun was sinking, falling behind the misty mountains. Shadows reached over the land. The soldiers of Mordor lifted their heads and also began to put on speed. The forest was dark and close. Already they had passed a few outlying trees. The land was beginning to slope upwards, ever more steep. But the orcs did not halt. Both Ugluk and Grishniak shouted, spurring them on to a last effort. They will make it yet. We will escape, thought Pippin. And then he managed to twist his neck so as to glance back with one eye over his shoulder. He saw that riders away eastward were already level with the orcs. Galloping over the plain, the sunset gilded their spears and helmets and glinted in their pale flowing hair. They were hemming the orcs in preventing them from scattering and driving them along the line of the river. He wondered very much what kind of folk they were. He wished now that he had learned more in Rivendell and looked more at maps and things. But in those days, the plans of their journey seemed to be in more competent hands. And he had never reckoned with being cut off from Gandalf or from Strider and even from Frodo. All that he could remember about Rohan was that Gandalf's horse, Shadowfax, had come from that land. That sounded hopeful as far as it went. But how will they know that we are not orcs? He thought. I don't suppose we've ever heard of hobbits down here. I suppose I ought to be glad that the beastly orcs look like being destroyed. I would rather be saved myself. The chances were that he and Merry would be killed together with their captors, before ever the men of Rohan were aware of them. A few of the riders appeared to be bowmen, skilled at shooting from a running horse. Riding swiftly into range, they shot arrows at the orcs that straggled behind, and several of them fell. Then the riders wheeled away out of the range of the answering bows of their enemies, who shot wildly, not daring to halt. This happened many times, and on one occasion arrows fell among the Isengarders. One of them, just in front of Pippin, stumbled and did not get up again. Night came down without the riders closing in for battle. Many orcs had fallen, but fully two hundred remained. In the early darkness, the orcs came to a hillock. The eaves of the forest were very near, probably no more than three furlongs away, but they could go no further. The horsemen had encircled them. A small band disobeyed Ugluk's command and ran towards the forest. 
Only three returned. Well, here we are, sneered Grishnak. Fine leadership. I hope the great Ugluk will lead us out again. Put those halflings down, ordered Ugluk, taking no notice of Grishnak. You, Rugdush, get two others and strand guard over them. They are not to be killed unless the filthy white skins break through. Understand? As long as I'm alive, I want them. They are not to cry out, and they are not to be rescued. Bind their legs. The last part of the order was carried out mercilessly, but Pippin found that for the first time was close to Merry. The orcs were making a great deal of noise, shouting and clashing their weapons, and the hobbits managed to whisper together for a while. I don't think much of this, said Merry. I feel nearly done in. I don't think I could crawl away far, even if I was free. Lambus, whispered Pippin. I've got some. Have you? I don't think they've taken anything but our swords. Yes, I had a packet in my pocket, answered Mary. But it must be better to crumbs. Anyway, I can't put my mouth in my pocket. You won't have to. I've... <coughs> but just then a savage kick warned Pippin that the noise had died down and the guards were watching. The night was cold and still. All around the knoll on which the orcs were gathered, little watchfires sprang up, golden red in the darkness, a complete ring of them. They were within long bowshot, but the riders did not show themselves against the light, and the orcs wasted many arrows shooting at the fires until Ugluk stopped them. The riders made no sound. Later in the night, when the moon came out of the mist, then occasionally they could be seen shadowy shapes that glinted now and again in the white light, as they moved in ceaseless patrol. they will wait for the sun, curse them! growled one of the guards. Why don't we get together and charge through? What's old Ugluk think he's doing, I should like to know? I dare say you would, snarled Ugluk, stepping up from behind. Meaning I don't think at all, eh? Curse you! You're as bad as the other rabble, the maggots, and the apes of the Lurg Burts. No good trying to charge with them. They'll just squeal and boat, and there are more than enough of these filthy horse boys to mop up our lot on the flat. There's only one thing those maggots can do. They can see like gimlets in the dark. Uh, but these white skins have better night eyes than most men, from what I've heard. And don't forget their horses! They can see the night breeze, or so it's said. Still, there's one thing the fine fellows don't know. Morhur and his lads are in the forest, and they'll show up at a time now. Ugluk's words were enough, apparently, to satisfy the Isengarders, but the other orcs were both dispirited and rebellious. They posted a few watchers, but most of them lay on the ground, resting in the pleasant darkness. It did indeed become very dark again, for the moon passed westward into thick cloud, and Pippin could not see anything a few feet away. The fires brought no light to the hillock. The riders were not, however, content merely to wait for the dawn and let their enemies rest. A sudden outcry on the east side of the knoll showed that something was wrong. It seemed that some of the men had ridden in close, slipped off their horses, crawled to the edge of the camp and killed several orcs, and then had faded away again. Ugluk dashed off to stop a stampede. Pippin and Merry sat up. Their guards, Isengarders, had gone with Ugluk, but if the hobbits had any thought of escape, it was soon dashed. A long, hairy arm took each of them by the neck and drew them close together. Dimly they were aware of Grishnak's great head and hideous face between them. His foul breath was on their cheeks. He began to paw them and feel them. Pippin shuddered as hard, cold fingers groped down his back. Well, my little ones, said Grishnak in a soft whisper. Enjoying your nice rest, or not? A little awkwardly placed, perhaps, with some whips on one side and nasty spears on the other. Little people should not meddle in affairs that are too big for them. His fingers continued to grope. There was a light like a pale but hot fire between his eyes. The thought came suddenly into Pippin's mind, as if caught direct from the urgent thought of his enemy. Krishna knows about the ring. He's looking for it. 
while Ugluk is busy. He probably wants it for himself. Cold fear was in Pippin's heart, yet at the same time he was wondering what use he could make of Grishnak's desire. Uh, I don't think you'll find it that way, he whispered. It, it, it isn't easy to find. Find it, said Grishnak. His fingers stopped crawling and gripped Pippin's shoulder. Find war. What are you talking about, little one? For a moment, Pippin was silent. Then suddenly, in the darkness, he made a noise in his throat. Gollum. Gollum. Nothing. My precious, he added. The hobbits felt Grishnak's fingers twitch. Hissed the goblin softly. That's what he means, is it? Oh, very, very dangerous, my little one. Perhaps, said Mary, now alert and aware of Pippin's guess. Perhaps, and not only for us. Still, you know your own business best. Do you want it or not? And what will you give for it? Do I want it? Do I want it? Said Grishnak, as if puzzled, but his arms were trembling. What would I give for it? What do you mean? We mean, said Pippin, choosing his words carefully, that it's no good groping in the dark. We could have saved you time and trouble. But you must untie our legs first, or we'll do nothing and say nothing. <sighs> My dear tender little fools, his Krishnak, everything you have and everything you know will be got out of you in due time. Every. You wish there was more they could tell to satisfy the questioner. Indeed you will. Quite soon. We shan't hurry the inquiry. Oh dear, no. What do you think you've been kept alive for, my dear little fellows? Please believe me when I say that it was not out of kindness, and not even one of Ugluk's faults. Oh, I find it quite easy to believe, said Mary. But you haven't got your prey home yet. And it doesn't seem to be going your way, whatever happens. If we come to Isengard, it won't be the great Grishnak that benefits. Saruman will take all that he can find. If you want anything for yourself, now's the time to do a deal. Gollum! Gollum! Said Pippin. Untie her legs! Said Mary. They felt the orc's arms trembling violently. Curse you, you filthy vermin! He hissed. Untie your legs. I'll untie every string in your bodies. Huge. Do you think I can search you? To the bones? Search you? I'll cut you both into quivering shreds. I don't need the help of your legs to carry you away and have you all to myself. Suddenly he seized them. The strength in his long arms and shoulders was terrifying, and he tucked them one under each armpit and crushed them fiercely into his sides. A great stifling hand was clapped over each of their mouths. Then he sprang forward, stooping low. Quickly and silently he went, until he came to the edge of the knoll. There, choosing a gap between the watches, he passed like an evil shadow out into the night. Down the slope and away westward towards the river that flowed out of the forest. In that direction, there was a wide open space with only one fire. After going a dozen yards, he halted, peering and listening. Nothing could be seen or heard. He crept slowly on, bent almost double. Then he squatted and listened again. Then he stood up, as if to risk a sudden dash. At that very moment, the dark form of a rider loomed up right in front of him. A horse snorted and reared. A man called out. Grishnak flung himself on the ground flat, dragging the hobbits under him. Then he drew his sword. No doubt he meant to kill his captives rather than allow them to escape or to be rescued. But it was his undoing. The sword rang faintly and glinted a little in the light of the fire. Away to his left. An arrow came whistling out of the gloom. It was aimed with skill, or guided by fate, and it pierced his right hand. He dropped the sword and shrieked. There was a quick beat of hoofs. And even as Grishnak leapt up and ran, he was ridden down, and a spear passed through him. He gave a hideous, shivering cry, and lay still. The hobbits remained flat on the ground, as Grishnak had left them. 
another horseman came riding swiftly to his comrade's aid. Whether because of some special keenness of sight or because of some other sense, the horse lifted and sprang lightly over them, but its rider did not see them, lying covered in their elven cloaks. Too crushed for the moment and too afraid to move. At last, Mary stirred and whispered softly. So far, so good. But how are we to avoid being spitted? The answer came almost immediately. The cries of Grishnak had roused the orcs. From the yells and screeches that came from the knoll, the hobbits guessed that their disappearance had been discovered. Ugluk was probably knocking off a few more heads. Then suddenly, the answering cries of orc voices came from the right, outside the circle of watchfires, from the direction of the forest and the mountains. Mahu had apparently arrived and was attacking the besiegers. There was the sound of galloping horses. The riders were drawing in their ring close around the knoll, risking the orc arrows so as to prevent any sortie, while a company rode off to deal with the newcomers. Suddenly, Merry and Pippin realized that without moving, they were now outside the circle. There was nothing between them and escape. Now, said Mary, if only we had our legs and hands free, we might get away. But I can't touch the knots. I can't bite them. No need to try, said Pippin. I was going to tell you, I've managed to free my hands. These loops are only left for sure. You better have a bit of Lembas first. He slipped the cords off his wrists and fished out a packet. The cakes were broken, but good, still in their leaf wrappings. The hobbits each ate two or three pieces. The taste brought back to them the memory of fair faces and laughter and wholesome food in quiet days now far away. For a while they ate thoughtfully, sitting in the dark, heedless of the cries and sounds of battle nearby. Pippin was the first to come back to the present. We must be off, he said. Half a moment. Grishnak's sword was lying close at hand, but it was too heavy and clumsy for him to use, so he crawled forward, and finding the body of the goblin, he drew from its sheath a long, sharp knife. With this, he quickly cut their bonds. Now for it, he said. When we've warmed up a bit, perhaps we shall be able to stand again and walk. But in many cases, we had better start by crawling. They crawled. The turf was deep and yielding, and that helped them, but it seemed a long and slow business. They gave the watchfire a wide berth and wormed their way forward bit by bit until they came to the edge of the river, gurgling away in the black shadows under its deep banks. Then they looked back. The sounds had died away. Evidently, Mohur and his lads had been killed or driven off. The riders had returned to their silent, ominous vigil. It would not last very much longer. Already the night was old. In the east, which had remained unclouded, the sky was beginning to grow pale. We must get under cover, said we, Pippin. Or we shall be seen. It will not be any comfort to us if these riders discover that we are not orcs after we are dead. He got up and stamped his feet. <sighs> Those cords have cut me like wires. But my feet are getting warm again. I should take it on now. What about you, Mary? Mary got up. Yes, he said. I can manage it. Lambus does put some heart in you. A more wholesome sort of feeling, too, than the heart of that orc dropped. I wonder what it was made of. Better not now, I expect. Let's get a drink of water and to wash away the thought of it. Uh, not here. The banks are too steep, said Pippin. Forward now. They turned and walked side by side, slowly along the line of the river. Behind them, the light grew in the east. As they walked, they compared notes, talking lightly in hobbit fashion of the things that had happened since their capture. No listener would have guessed from their words that they had suffered cruelly, and been in dire peril, going without hope towards torment and death. Or that even now, as they knew well, they had little chance of ever finding friend or safety again. Oh, you seem to have been doing well, Master Tuke, said Mary. You'll get almost a chapter in old Bilbo's book, <laughs> if ever I get the chance to report to him. Good work. Especially guessing that hairy villain's little gang, and plying up to him. But I wonder if anyone will ever pick up your trail and find that brooch. I should hate to lose mine, but I'm afraid yours is gone for good. Oh, I shall have to brush up my toes if I am ever to get level with you. Indeed, Cousin Brandybuck is going in front now. This is where he comes in. I don't suppose you have much notion where we are, but I spent my time at Rivendell rather better. We are walking west along the Entwash. The butt end of the Misty Mountains is in front, and Fangorn Forest. Even as he spoke, the dark edge of the forest loomed up straight before them. 
Night seemed to have taken refuge under its great trees, creeping away from the coming dawn. Lead on, Master Brandybuck, said Pippin, or lead back. We have been warned against Fangorn, but one so knowing will not have forgotten that. I have not, answered Merry. But the forest seems better to me all the same than turning back into the middle of a battle. He led the way in under the huge branches of the trees. Old beyond guessing, they seemed. Great trailing beards of lichen hung from them, blowing and swaying in the breeze. Out of the shadows the hobbits peeped, gazing back down the slope. Little furtive figures that in the dim light looked like elf children, in the deeps of time, peering out of the wild wood in wonder at their first dawn. Far over the great river and the brown lands, leagues upon leagues away, the dawn came, red as flame. Loud rang the hunting horns to greet it. The riders of Rohan sprang suddenly to life. Horn answered horn again. Merry and Pippin heard, clear in the cold air, the neighing of war horses and the sudden singing of many men. The sun's limb was lifted, an arc of fire above the margin of the world. Then with a great cry the riders charged from the east. The red light gleamed on mail and spear. The orcs yelled and shot all the arrows that remained to them. The hobbits saw several horsemen fall, but their line held up on the hill and over it. End wheeled round and charged again. Most of the raiders that were left alive then broke and fled, this way and that, pursued one by one to the death. But one band, holding together in a black wedge, drove forward resolutely in the direction of the forest. Straight up the slope they charged towards the watchers. Now they were drawing near, and it seemed certain that they would escape. They had already hewn down the three riders that barred their way. We have watched too long, said Mary. There is Zuglik. I don't want to meet him again. The hobbits turned and fled deep into the shadows of the wood. So it was that they did not see their last stand, when Uglik was overtaken and brought to bay at the very edge of Fangorn. There he was slain at last by Eomer, the third marshal of the Mark, who dismounted and fought him sword to sword, and over the wide fields the keen-eyed riders hunted down the few orcs that had escaped and still had strength to fly. Then when they had laid their fallen comrades in a mound and had sung their praises, the riders made a great fire and scattered the ashes of their enemies. So ended the raid, and no news of it came ever back to either Mordor or Isengard. But the smoke of the burning rose high to heaven and was seen by many watchful eyes. <laughs>